Hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Diet, Nutrition, Physical Activity and Cancer, Evidence to Action. My name is Melissa Habedonk, and I will be the moderator for today's session. I am the Senior Director of External Relations and Strategic Health Initiatives at the American Institute for Cancer Research, or AICR. Before I tell you about today's webinar and speakers, I'd like to briefly tell you about the American Institute for Cancer Research, where our speakers and I work. AICR funds cutting edge research and gives people practical tools and information to help them prevent and survive cancer. Our vision is to live in a world where no one develops a preventable cancer. And driving this vision is our mission, to champion the latest and most authoritative scientific research from around the world on cancer prevention and survival through diet, weight, and physical activity so that we can help people make informed lifestyle choices to reduce their cancer risk. Now, let's take a closer look at what our speakers will be covering today. Next slide. Today's webinar will discuss how the American Institute for Cancer Researchers research helps people reduce their cancer risk and improve their outcomes after a diagnosis. Specifically, the speakers will dive into the strong evidence be behind ASCR's 10 cancer prevention recommendations, the compelling research demonstrating that adherence to these recommendations has a substantial impact on cancer risk and outcomes, and programs that ASCR offers to help people make positive lifestyle changes. And following ASCR's evidence-based recommendations will also reduce the risk of other common non-communicable diseases and are a blueprint for overall health through diet, nutrition, and physical activity. For the next hour, you will be joined by two distinguished speakers, Dr. Nigel Brockton and Sheena Patel-Swanner. So let's learn a little bit about each and we'll do this in the order in which they'll speak today. Next slide, please. Dr. Nigel Brockton is the Vice President of Research at the American Institute for Cancer Research. After more than two decades as a cancer researcher, a two-time oh. cancer survivor, and a fervent cancer research advocate, he joined ASCR in 2017. He now combines all of his passions directing the ASCR research program spanning the cancer continuum through cancer prevention, treatment, and survivorship. Nigel earned his PhD in genetic epidemiology of colorectal cancer risk from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. He then moved to Canada to establish his own research program in cancer molecular, molecular epidemiology that focuses on the impact of lifestyle factors on cancer metastases, particularly in breast, colorectal, and head and neck cancers. He maintains an appointment of adjunct associate professor at the University of Calgary's Department of Community Health Sciences, and he continues to conduct collaborative research using the rich data and biospecimen resources there. Next slide. Sheena Patel Swanner brings more than a decade of experience working on health promotion, wellness, and disease prevention and management to her role as the Director of Nutrition Programs at the American Institute for Cancer Research. At ASCR, she oversees evidence-based programs focusing on reducing cancer risk by promoting improved nutrition, diet, and weight management. And she provides practical tips and tools to implement ASCR's recommendations. Prior to joining ASCR, Sheena worked with the older adult population directing nutrition programs in, co in community settings. She also worked in the clinical nutrition setting and with the United States Air Force as a health promotions dietitian. Sheena is passionate about helping individuals improve their overall quality of life through nutrition and diet. And she is enthusiastic about making cancer pre prevention a reality by empowering and motivating individuals in a fun, healthy, and inspiring way with her curated content, blogs, webinars, and speaking engagements. Next slide. The speakers do not have any disclosures to report. Next slide. So a few final quick things before we dive in. First, on behalf of myself and the speakers, we want to extend a huge thank you to the Society for Integrated Oncology for making this webinar possible. Second, 
A recording of this webinar with the slides will be made available on SIO's website. It will also be made available on AICR's website. Finally, please stick around because the speakers will remain available after the presentation for Q&A. So please type your questions into the Q&A box, which will be monitored. And you can begin typing these questions in at any time. You don't have to wait until then. And we'll get to as many of them as possible. Next slide. Now, without further ado, Dr. Brockton, please get us started. Good morning. My name's, oh, good afternoon. My name's Nigel Brockton. I'm the uh, Vice President of Research at AICR. And uh, so Melissa has given you a little bit of a background on AICR. Uh, and yeah, my experience of AICR before I joined was that they are the world's leading expert or authority on the links between diet, weight, physical activity, and cancer. And as a, as a researcher, if I wanted to know what the latest kind of summary of the evidence was on a particular factor, I would go to one of the AICR documents that was relevant. Uh, so, Part of my role now is to convince other people that uh, we are the leading authority, but that comes from my own personal experience. And you know, how have we uh, gained that reputation is a little bit of what I'm gonna start talking to you about. So I first became aware of AICR in 1997 when I started my PhD, uh, and this coincided with them uh, launching the first expert report, which at the time was the first attempt really to summarize all the global evidence relating to diet, nutrition, and physical activity, food and nutrition, as it was called then. Uh, there was quite scant information. Uh, it was really a, a very nascent field at the time. Uh, apparently there's an issue with my audio. I'll try. Um, so, yeah, the, but this was still at the time the, the most uh, authoritative document that summarized all the evidence. Uh, then 10 years later, the second expert report came out and there'd really been an explosion both in the volume and the, uh, the quality of the evidence uh, in that intervening 10 years. And in the process of you know, taking this new evidence uh, and, and synthesizing it into these conclusions and actually the first iteration of the real rec uh, iteration of the recommendations, a whole process was developed uh, called the Continuous Update Project, which has been taken forward and is now, after the publication of the third expert report in 2018, uh, is now going into a transition, but this is a very uh, rigorous and transparent process. The first two reports were sort of four or 500 page uh, single documents uh, with the explosion of the, the evidence or further explosion, if you like, of the evidence over the next 10 years. Uh, this is a, a massive undertaking. Um, each of these reports that makes up the third expert report starts with a protocol uh, so that we say what we're going to do, and then we do it. So that reduces the chance of any sort of post hoc analyses and uh, if you like data dredging. Uh, the systematic review that comes out of that are incredibly comprehensive documents that gets summarized into a, a cup report, which is cancer specific. For the third expert report, we also did exposure chapters. So rather than looking by cancer, we can look by exposure. Uh, there are also some sort of supporting chapters uh, dealing with you know, describing the process, really giving a, an overview of cancer, uh, an overview of the recommendations, uh, diet and uh, diet, nutrition, physical activity, and um, weight gain, overweight, and obesity. Uh, but all of this is kind of summarized in this 116 page report. But that is really the sort of, sort of gateway to the larger report. And I like to think of this as a, a funnel of evidence from these systematic reviews 
to the the cut reports to the uh, the summary and ultimately that the after the judgment of the expert panel that gives rise to the the cancer prevention recommendations so this whole initiative covers 17 cancers 51 million people and three and a half million cancer cases so it's a a pretty massive undertaking. And just to give you an example, the breast cancer SLR, Systematic Literature Review, is over 2,000 pages. The breast cancer cup report is a little over 200 pages. So yeah, if depending on what level of evidence and, or what level of detail you want, you can track back up and down uh, through these documents. And they're all available online. So these are our recommendations, and I'm going to be going through the evidence that supports each of these. Uh, in an ideal world, people would uh, adhere to all of them, uh, but any improvement you can make in any of these will impact your, your cancer risk uh, by greater, inhere greater adherence, reducing your risk. But as Karen Collins, our nutrition uh, advisor, says, this is a call for action, not for perfection. So don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. And everyone can make uh, changes and improvements to their lifestyle. So how do we do this? One of the reasons, well, I guess one of the one of the reasons we do this is in particularly in epidemiologic studies, but also in mechanistic studies when they're reported in the press, it creates a lot of confusion for people that what is the real answer? One thing, one week, one thing's good for you, the next week, something's bad for you. And it leaves the consumer uh, and the health professionals very confused about what is the, the latest state of play. I'll give you an example here. This is for uh, whole milk consumption uh, and breast cancer risk. And this is, each of these is what's called a forest plot. The size of the, the square, and sometimes it's a diamond and sometimes it's a circle. So whatever that blob is in the middle gives you an idea of the size of the population, at least relative to the others. Uh, and its position on that line of one, one represents no change in risk. Lower than one indicates a reduced risk, higher than one in, indicates a, an elevated risk. So you can see that the, the overall, so this is the summary estimate, this is the diamond down here, is bang on one. Um, early study back in 2002, large study showed really no significant effect. Uh, same thing in 2009. Then in 2013, there was a study that showed for premenopausal women, although not significant because the blob is the, the population and this line is the confidence interval. So as a point estimate, this is a 46, or could be perceived as a 46% increased risk uh, associated with, and this is 150 grams of whole milk per day. Uh, so this is a linear dose response in our measure analysis. Um, and on the flip side over here, you can see still the summary estimates are for no, no effect, but there's a um, 0.62 relative risk, so that's a 38% reduced risk. But really, in the, in the scheme of things, these are not significant results, and we would stick with, there's no change in risk with milk intake uh, in breast cancer. So that's just an example to show how we approach uh, the linear dose response meta-analyses. We also do non-linear dose response meta-analyses if the evidence allows. Uh, because for some exposures, the, the relationship changes. Sometimes it's a U-shape, sometimes uh, it sort of goes up exponentially. This is for fiber. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but it shows that really the effect of fiber really only becomes significant beyond 30 grams per day. So if you're looking at a population that has uh, an income, uh, an intake below that, you're unlikely to see an effect. And so again, this is, you can summarize, you can use forest plots to show graphically um, the impact of a collection of studies. I mean, this is 22 studies. 
the overall effect size is down here at the bottom, uh, which is, and this is uh, for ethanol, 10 grams per day, typical uh, serving in the US or North America is 14 grams, excuse me. And you can see, although, actually this would be a good example of, you know, back in 1993, this first study, wow, it shows a 15% reduced risk of, of breast cancer with alcohol consumption, albeit not significant. But just about all of the studies since, and the, the summary estimate is about a 9% uh, increased risk per 10 grams of, of ethanol. Uh, so this is just a good way to, to visualize and to come up with a quantitative uh, result for the risk associated with a given exposure. Uh, and here, this is the, so this is linear, this is the non-linear, although for breast cancer and alcohol, it's pretty linear. And there's no, this is why you know, we make the point that there's no safe dose for, um, of alcohol for breast cancer. So I'm going to go through each of the recommendations now. Uh, they're largely kind of uh, grouped into activity and body weight, diet and nutrition, and then we have some kind of special recommendations at the end. So we'll start off with healthy weight, be a healthy weight, keep your weight within a healthy weight range, uh, and avoid weight gain in adult life. And the reason for this is that uh, overweight and obesity, uh, increases the risk for 12 types of cancer. You'll sometimes see 13 quoted. That's because IARC um, added meningioma, as, uh, which is a brain cancer associated with um, obesity. Uh, again, as I, this is my reason for kind of uh, laboring the point about forest plots to give you an idea of how to interpret these. So you'll see the 12 cancers on the, the right side of that uh, one line. Uh, the, and the, the size of these shapes gives you an idea of the, the amount of research that's been done. So obviously an awful lot of it in postmenopausal breast cancer and colorectal cancer. The interesting one, and this really, the third expert report was the first time that this was really pulled out. To acknowledge it as, as a legitimate effect that uh, early adult uh, obesity is a protective factor in premenopausal breast cancer. We, it had been dismissed as uh, residual confounding, uh, but it does seem to be a real biologic effect and is a, an active area of research. But from a public health point of view, we would not recommend that people uh, gain weight in early adulthood because obesity does tend to track into later adulthood. And then we have problems with uh, you know, the, the greater risk of other cancers. The next one is be physically active. Uh, be physically active as part of your everyday life, walk more and sit less. So I mean, it's deliberately physically active and not exercise because any types of physical activity uh, will be beneficial. That's borne out by the data on colorectal cancer where total physical activity uh, creates a, an almost 20% reduced risk of colorectal cancer. Um, th this is the, the reason these are reported as occupational recreational is just because this is where most of the, the evidence is. Uh, but you know, again, strong effects in endometrial cancer, uh, total activity for breast cancer and strong evidence for vigorous activity in premenopausal. And that may be more to do with the, the way that the, the studies in premenopausal breast cancer have been uh, designed and reported. But overall, being active uh, is beneficial. It should, because physical activity is hard to quantify, <coughs> excuse me, uh, these were done as the highest versus lowest. So it's not the straight linear or the, um, the, the non-linear dose response, uh, but still strong, convincing, consistent results. So when we launched the third expert report, uh, there was a, 
you know, we presented the, the new recommendations, which were quite similar to the ones in the 2007 report. Um, and somebody made the comment of, well, if you have one recommendation for body weight and one recommendation for physical activity, but you have five for, for diet and nutrition, is that because diet and nutrition is more important? And it's not, it's just that diet and nutrition are much more uh, complex. So if we just said to people, be a healthy weight, be active, eat a healthy diet, a healthy diet can mean many different things to many different people. So that's why it's broken down into the component pieces to try and help give people the recommendations to help them lead a healthier life. So the first one is to eat a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans. Uh, and really this is, been born out in other chronic diseases and, and in all dietary patterns that the more of these uh, plant-based foods you can eat the lower your risk and you know, whole grains is a big part of that this is the first the third expert report was the first time that this really came out uh, and 18 percent sorry 17 percent reduced risk associated with 90 grams of whole grains per day uh, and that seems to be independent of fiber uh, but again, fiber has a strong impact on, on colorectal cancer, 9% uh, reduced risk uh, per 10 grams per day. And the recommended uh, minimum intake is about 30 grams per day. So these are substantial. And the, the mechanisms for this could be through uh, the microbiome. Uh, we don't know the exact mechanisms, but we know that... Uh, this is a very consistent uh, effect. And to, to give you this slide again, showing that below about 30 grams per day, there's not much effect of fiber. Uh, and then the typical US uh, adult only eats about 15 grams of fiber per day. So this is why you know, our messaging is get that fiber up. Um, and 30 grams in a lot of other populations is really not very high intake. So it's, it's certainly achievable. Limit consumption of fast foods and other processed foods. So the, a lot of this research comes from the, the obesity world. And we know that eating uh, larger amounts of processed foods increases intakes uh, of calorific intakes and is strongly associated with obesity. So the mechanism for this recommendation really operates through that obesity link. And that's part of the reason we did the diet, nutrition, physical activity, energy balance and body fatness report to really look at the determinants of weight gain, overweight and obesity. And you can see some of the, you know, because weight gain, overweight and obesity is such a strong risk factor for cancer. It's not surprising that we see some of the same, if you like, uh, usual suspects, uh, both in the, for the reducing risk of overweight and obesity uh, and increasing. Uh, something to point out here, you'll see, uh, where's screen time gone? Screen time was stronger for, uh, for children than adults, because not because the effect is any different, but because the types of studies that have been done, a lot more randomized control trials in children and cohort studies in adults. So same effect, but just the way we assess the evidence gives you a slightly different result. Right. Limit consumption of red and processed meat. Eat no more than moderate amounts of meat, which is 300 to 350 to 500 grams uh, cooked weight of red meat per week. And really avoid, eat little, if any, processed meat. And this is for red and processed meat together. There's a 12% increased risk of colorectal cancer per 100 grams uh, per day. So looking at colorectal, uh, sorry, at red meat alone, uh, there's approximately a 5% uh, increased risk uh, at 100 grams per day. So 
processed meat is, if, if you like, a stronger, um, has a stronger carcinogenic effect. Um, so that's why we recommend really avoiding that. There are reasons to, to eat red meat, and as long as it's in uh, moderate or lower amounts, then the risk is, is kind of acceptable. Limit consumption of sugar sweetened drinks. Again, this one re really operates through the, the obesity um, pathway. Uh, it's in that, it's one of the determinants of weight gain, overweight and obesity. It's part of our um, recommendations to reduce sugar, both sugar is found in sugar sweetened drinks, which is I think the, the main uh, source of added sugars in the US population, but it's also in foods that you might not even expect. So again, reducing processed foods would reduce the, the intake of added sugars. Limit alcohol consumption. For cancer prevention, it's best not to drink alcohol. And this is always a, uh, a topic of discussion. Um, it does differ between different cancers. Uh, there are cancers for which there is no safe uh, alcohol intake. Esophageal cancer, for instance, it's, again, if you think of these, the dotted line is a confidence interval, the point estimate continues up in the middle there, but really at no low dose is there, a, is there any, any ambiguity for esophageal cancer. For colorectal cancer, really, it becomes significant at about between one and two drinks per day. Uh, but if you take cancers as a whole, uh, and since in the prevention setting, you don't know which cancer you're at greatest risk for or what you might get. So certainly uh, drink in moderation or no more than moderation, follow the national guidelines if you decide to drink. Uh, but for cancer prevention, it is best not to drink. So I think we have a poll coming up. Yes. So Morgan is going to launch a poll where you get to vote. So the poll question is, what type of alcoholic beverage is associated with the greatest risk of breast cancer? Beer, wine, liquor, spirits are all about the same. So you can only choose one. I don't get to vote. So once people vote, Morgan is going to put the results up. Very good, a very knowledgeable audience. <laughs> So the, uh, the answer is, that, oh, I need to close that. The answer is they're all about the same. Uh, this is the, the risk for alcohol uh, in pre and postmenopausal breast cancer. The risk is higher in postmenopausal breast cancer, but similar, I guess. And they're all really about the same. Um, the health halo that surrounds alcohol in cardiovascular disease. Even that is being questioned now due to the study designs that we used and the, the inclusion of non-drinkers who are a lot of drinkers who had to give up because of the problems that it, the health problems that it caused. So it's pretty clear that for cancer prevention, we should not be drinking. Uh, don't use supplements for cancer prevention. Aim to meet nutritional needs through diet alone. And there are reasons for, for people to take supplements, but cancer prevention is not one of them. The slight caveat to that, why has it not clicked forward? Is that there, there is evidence, for instance, in colorectal cancer, uh, that calcium supplementation may reduce or can reduce risk, but because there are potentially uh, uh, opposite effects in other cancers, we don't make a recommendation based on this. So this is really for um, maybe for people at higher risk of colorectal cancer and certainly a conversation to have uh, with healthcare providers and not just a general prevention message. 
breastfeeding uh, for mothers, obviously. Uh, breastfeed your baby if you can. It's good for the mother and it's good for the baby. There's a small but statistically significant reduction in breast cancer risk for the mother. And there's a reduction in risk of obesity for the offspring. And after diagnosis, follow the recommendations if you can. We recommend you check with your health professional to decide what's right for, for the individual cancer survivor. But you know, this is a growing population. There are over 32 million people worldwide living, with a cancer, living beyond a cancer diagnosis. There's persuasive evidence on diet, nutrition, physical activity uh, that they predict outcomes, but limited in evidence on the impact of changing these. So as an example, we know that if you're at a healthy, in a healthy BMI at diagnosis, you have a better survival than someone who has overweight or obesity. The, the caveat to that is we don't have strong evidence right now for what weight loss does in that situation. Does that, if you go from uh, having obesity to a normal weight, does that improve, improve your outcomes? So this is kind of an acknowledgement of some of the limitations of that evidence, but the, the CUP expert panel judges the following recommendations is unlikely to be harmful uh, if you finish treatment. And this is really a key uh, future direction for research in the future. And you know, this is going back to the 2014 report where, uh, you know, following the same process that we do for the um, incidence data, looking at the, um, what is the strength of evidence for each of these exposures in the survival setting? And really nothing reached the bar of strong evidence. Uh, several factors in this sort of limited suggestive area, um, but nothing that we felt was suitably strong that we could make um, you know, specific recommendations to cancer survivors or even breast cancer survivors. So that is an area of research that's um, ongoing. We have just repeated the breast cancer uh, survival analysis and they're being, uh, they've been actually submitted rather than a, a cut report, they've been submitted for academic publications. Um, so there will be an update, uh, but I, there is a, there's only been kind of incremental progress in that area. So certainly an area that we are um, hoping for more evidence to accumulate in the near future. So going back to what we know, this is in the back of our th third expert report, the printed summary. This is a very helpful um, fold out and it's very small to see on here, but really these exposures that are um, categorized by diet and nutrition, physical activity, body fatness, and each of the cancers down the side. This includes the limited suggestive. Maybe more helpful is the strong evidence matrix, which shows for each of these cancers what we really know. For things like prostate cancer, we really only know about um, adult body fatness and adult attained height. And we can't do much about our adult attained height. So really, in terms of what you can do to reduce prostate cancer um, risk, it's just maintaining a healthy body weight. For colorectal cancer, there's 10 factors. So a very preventable cancer uh, and also one of the most common cancers. So it is one of the drivers of our, our recommendation, some of our recommendations. Uh, so we have strong evidence from the 2007, using the 2007 recommendations over the 10 years, uh, and, and it continued even after the publication of the third expert report, uh, people using those recommendations to score people's lifestyle. But one of the problems was that they, each group really defined the score in a different way. So whilst overall it was very helpful, directly comparing uh, the studies that scored lifestyle, adherence to the lifestyle was very difficult. So, so I, I'm going to click that one forward. Um, so we developed a score, a standardized score with the, uh, I lost control. So 
sorry. We developed a score with the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and so this is a standardized way of scoring each of these. And we, there's now a website on the National Cancer Institute page, uh, a web page on the National Cancer Institute site uh, showing how to use this score uh, and all of you know how it was derived and there's a couple of papers published so uh, we really hope this is going to help to um, make the adherence studies much more useful but both for cancer risk and uh, survival outcomes following these recommendations has a, a strong effect on people's outcomes and here's a graphic sh that shows how the um, how the score is worked out. Really, you get, if you're not meeting a recommendation, you get zero points. If you're kind of meeting the recommendation, you get half a point. And uh, if you're meeting it, uh, ideally, you get a full point. So that's, in summary, how these things are scored. So I'm going to hand off to Sheena, who's going to really show you how to take these recommendations and, and make them a reality in, in real life. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nigel. Um, well, now that you guys have heard about the recommendations and the research um, that supports them, I want to take some time to talk about how you can put AICR's recommendations into action. We know the what and we know the why, and now we're going to dig into the how and, and that practical, um, practical, practical aspect. And so for the providers out there, you know, we know you wear a lot of different hats day to day. And there isn't always a time that you may have to focus solely on behavior change and education. And you know, we know those things take time. So we hear you and we wanna make your jobs easier. And with that, I wanna discuss um, a few different programs and tools that AICR has created over the years, um, really to help people make healthy lifestyle choices a daily part of their routine, while being fun, interactive, motivating, essentially really translating that science into something more tangible. And um, today, the, the programs and tools that I'm going to be um, giving you a, a brief overview of are AICR's Cancer Health Check, our Healthy 10 Challenge Program, our Healthy Recipe Program, our Media Library, and then I'll end um, with talking about AICR's online store. So to get into it, I'm going to introduce AICR's Cancer Health Check. This is a really great online assessment to help individuals determine how closely um, they're following our recommendations. So kind of the adherence to the recommendations that Nigel just went over. It's a really fun, easy to use tool that can be accessed on a phone, a computer, tablet. It can be taken in under five minutes and um, it's, it's really accessible. So once an individual starts the assessment, they'll answer a series of questions based on um, what they're eating and how much they're moving along with other kind of lifestyle based questions at the, uh, that will then kind of be compiled and an individual will receive personalized feedback in the form of a re report summary at the end. And this report summary will highlight different areas that an individual is doing well in and then also highlight the areas where there still needs to be some improvement. It's a, it's a really good snapshot into providing information to really make individuals aware of their current behaviors and then helping them, um, giving them some practical kind of tips and resources to help them transition to kind of some healthy, healthy changes. And on this slide here, um, just so you can kind of get a good overview of the Cancer Health Check, I've taken screenshots um, of the different parts of the Cancer Health Check. So it begins by asking general information, so height, weight, and activity level, and then shifts towards specific questions focusing on nutrition and diet, specifically intake-based questions. So um, amount of fruits and vegetables eaten, whole grains, red and processed meat, sugar and fat, and alcohol intake. And then the, the, the question, the cancer health check ends by asking some lifestyle-based questions on sun safety and tobacco use. So here's kind of a screenshot. Um, so after somebody submits their uh, cancer health check, they'll, they'll be given a report summary. 
And so the report summary is kind of broken down, um, as you can see, into different categories there. And next to each category, um, there appears different smiley faces. So um, you have the happy face in green, the expressionless face in yellow, and then the sad face in red. Um, a happy face or that green smiley face indicates that someone is um, following the recommendation. The expressionless face, um, you know, indicates that hey, you you might be following parts of the recommendation. You still have some improvement to make in the in the in that area, and then the the red sad face means you're currently not following the recommendation, and, and there is some room for improvement. So the report summary also goes further into detail, um, and it does provide again specific information on small improvements that are achievable, and then links to different areas on AICR's website on you know, what an individual can do to improve in that specific area. So it's really nice. It kind of gives them that snapshot and then allows them to kind of find out more about it. Um, really great tool because it can be easily shared. The results can be emailed or shared on social platforms. And in my conversations with health, healthcare professionals, um, I've talked to several dietitians who actually have their patients take cancer health check um, before an appointment, and then they re review the results with them. And I've heard that this is really great. It helps both the provider and the patient, you know, can help start that conversation, help with goal setting. Um, so definitely be sure to check it out. You can go to cancerhealthcheck.org to um, take the cancer health check and learn more about it. All right, so our next program is our Healthy 10 Challenge. Um, this is a really fun um, lifestyle program that we actually launched and rebranded last February. The Healthy 10 Challenge is a 10-week program that uses practical approaches to putting our recommendations into action, one um, step or challenge, if you will, at a time. So there's 10 challenges, one challenge per week, that focus on either uh, nutrition and diet or physical activity and movement-related goal. And each week really alternates between the two, as we know both are key elements as a part of a healthy and balanced lifestyle. And so on the screen, you can kind of see here, um, you know, what each week's focus is. So for example, week one focuses on, um, you know, focusing on a healthier plate. Week two, again, then, you know, shifts to kind of movement, getting up and, and kind of moving um, and so on and so forth. The challenge here is really, you know, had been designed to meet individuals where they are to help people build healthy habits to lower cancer risk along with other chronic diseases. And we've seen that whether someone is new to changing their lifestyle behaviors, or even if they've been working at it for a while, both types of individuals can really benefit. I, I specifically heard from several oncology dietitians and providers, and you know, we know that during a cancer diagnosis, it can be difficult for indiv individuals to really balance, you know, all that's going on. They're they're trying to manage, you know. Um, you know, medications and just the reality of, of what they're going through, all while also trying to make improvements to their daily habits. And we've seen here that, you know, the Healthy 10 Challenge is a good um, tool for these individuals. It really meets the people where they are. It's a self-paced challenge. It's easy to use. You know, we've made it so it's not overwhelming and it's friendly. And the great thing is it can complement and support potential other nutrition programs or classes a, a patient may currently um, be enrolled in. And the, the great thing about the Healthy 10 Challenge is it can be repeated. Um, an individual can take it as many times as they want. Um, and then also, once you sign up for the challenge, you have um, access to all the materials um, that the challenge offers. So um, after signing up for the challenge, individuals will start receiving emails with tips, tools, motivations that really guide them through that 10 weeks. And, you know, we've heard that this is also nice, especially for individuals who may not be following up with their provider as often, but they still kind of want some, some type of support or program to go through. Um, again, the challenge features a variety of delicious recipes, handouts that can be printed, um, along with other tools. And so definitely encourage everyone to check that out. You can go to the website. Um, it, it tells you all about the challenge. And then also kind of, we have a great page on there that highlights, again, some of that research if, if you're interested as well. Um, so healthy10challenge.org. All right, and um, our next uh, program, AICR's Healthy Recipes, um, a very popular part of our website. Um, we have a great variety of um, recipes. You can search by specific ingredients or even a type of dish that you're looking for. And all of AICR's recipes 
really have been created and developed to support cancer risk reduction and survival. Our recipe have, recipes really feature um, several cancer protective ingredients, um, like those fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, and, and really take into consideration and incorporate our 10 recommendations. We recently as well um, have added in some new symptom-focused recipes that may be helpful for individuals that are you know, newly diagnosed or um, someone that's going into treatment. Um, so certain considerations for different side effects, um, whether it's constipation or nausea, mouth sores, or trouble swallowing. So that's a really um, great new addition we have. So if you're looking you know, for an appetizer, a main meal, a salad, even some healthy beverages or kid-friendly recipes, we really do have a great variety. Um, one thing that we've also recently done in the last year is update all of our recipes. Um, we have a nutrition facts label um, with each recipe, so you kind of know the nu nutrient breakdown. And then many of our recipes also have videos that, that can be really helpful to just kind of walk you through it. And um, I wanna take a minute to talk about AICR's media library. We have some great resources um, that are free and available to you, um, ranging from recorded videos and webinars, quizzes, um, printable infographics, and then even some other activities that really can be beneficial to a wide variety of, of audiences and individuals. Um, so again, some shareable infographics on different topics like physical activity, food safety, and whole grains. Um, we have some several kind of fun interactive quizzes on topics like weight, um, myths and facts, and, and movement and physical activity. And then again, a lot of great videos and then some webinars as well on just a variety of some topics on our research and our recommendations. So be sure to, to check that out as well. And then lastly, I want to take a minute to talk about AICR's online store health professionals, cancer survivors, or really anyone that wants to improve their health and learn more about AICR's evidence-based re research can do so um, with our wide variety of materials that we have available. Our online store has brochures, handouts, downloadable fact sheets, um, tear pads, and then other kind of interactive tools. Um, one thing I, I do like to point out, we recently added a 10 recommendations toolkit, and this is specifically for healthcare professionals, um, which really helps helps you guys you know, present on AICR's recommendations. The toolkit actually has a ready-made presentation, a script, and then handouts and different materials to go along with the presentation. Um, so you, know, you have everything you need to really present to your, to your different audiences. We also have several you know, free resources and free downloadables. One that I'd like to, to touch base on is one of our popular publications is our Cancer Resource. And this book is really great, uh, good tool, especially for those newly diagnosed individuals. Um, it's something that you know, individuals take their, to their appointments. Um, there's information you know, regarding you know, what should I ask my provider to you know, eat this and avoid this depending on you know different symptoms so it's a really really great comprehensive uh, publication there so you can learn more about each of our uh, publications by visiting our store at store.aicr.org and then to wrap up i really just want to encourage everyone continue to um, keep track of any advances in cancer prevention and survivorship by visiting our website. We have some great resources, blogs. Um, we have a monthly e-publication that goes out, our cancer focus that you can sign up for, as well as a healthy recipe that we send out monthly. Um, we're active on several, all of our social media platforms, so be sure to follow us and you know, interact with us. And thank you all so much. I will hand it back to you now, Melissa. Thank you so much, Nigel and Sheena. So this concludes the presentation portion of our webinar. Um, and we're gonna begin the Q&A now. Thanks to those of you that have inputted questions, keep them coming, we'll get to as many as possible. I'm gonna keep my camera off here, um, but I know that Nigel and Sheena are ready. So let me just open up the Q&A box here. Let's just start right here at the top. In 2007, the meat guidelines said, quote, limit consumption of red meat and avoid processed meat, end quote. In 2018, it was unfortunately altered to, quote, limit consumption of red meat and processed meat, end quote. 
processed meat is considered a class one carcinogen by the WHO. Why was this changed? So I think this question is to me. <laughs> Uh, this really comes down to accessibility and of the recommendations and people's willingness to, to pay attention to them. Uh, it hasn't really changed. Um, if you look at the, the sub recommendation, it says, you know, eat little, if any, uh, processed meat. Um, you know, so, and our kind of messaging on this is you know, if you have a hot dog at a a ball game or you know a, a ham sandwich you know it's it's your daily habits that impact your your cancer risk so we you know we defined what is meant by moderate amounts of, of red meat we still say limit uh processed meat but if you know we don't want to freak people out and, and just generally with the recommendations and we, we get this across some of the others as well, where people are like, why don't you tell people never to do this? Because if people read that and they think, well, I, I can't meet that, so I'm not going to do any of them. So it is kind of a messaging piece as well. But the, the underlying evidence is, uh, is very strong and our message is aimed at the the whole of the public. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Nigel. Moving right along here. Here's an audience question. There are many nutritionists who are promoting expensive tests to detect specific deficiencies and prescribe personalized supplements to cancer patients. Will this provide additional benefit for cancer survival rather than concentrating on following the ASCR dietary recommendations? I'd like to take this one as well. Sorry, Sheena. <laughs> uh, there are lots of people offering these kind of genomic tests uh, and they are not evidence-based. So you can look at you know, little genetic uh, changes in genes associated with folate metabolism or, you know, any other number of things and you can make a, a mechanistic case that they may have an impact but there is no empirical evidence to show that they make a difference so uh, and, 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 we, and we also know that whole diets are much more effective than supplements so uh, I as an overall strategy, a whole food plant-based diet is a much more effective way uh, of approaching both reducing cancer risk and improving uh, outcomes after diagnosis. You, you may, if you want to chip in at all, Sheena. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> and to just echo what you were saying, you know, as a dietitian, I always recommend people to, to get their nutrients directly from the food. You know, um, there's a lot of other benefits that go along with it, you know. So eat, eat real food. <laughs> That's the message there. All right, here's another question from the audience. There is a great deal of questions among patients in active treatment as to what they should eat. And most oncologists recommend eat all as long as you don't lose weight. What is ASCR's stand on this issue? So I'd like to maybe start with this. Um, I think it really depends on the individual. And that's why, you know, as a registered dietitian, I think, you know, it's really important for um, oncologists to refer their patients to uh, a dietitian so they can have that conversation. Um, everyone's going to be different. Everyone's diagnosis is going to be different. And it's really important to understand that before we can really make those kind of specific <laughs> recommendations. Um, Nigel, do you well, want to I'll, yeah, I'll chip in partly from a personal uh, perspective. Um, so I was diagnosed with cancer and treated in the late 90s, late 80s, early 90s, uh, before the, the obesity epidemic, um, when the greatest concern of uh, oncologists and, and nursing staff was maintaining people's weight because of the, the awful nausea that went with the treatments. Uh, and the fact that people were already around about a healthy weight. 
So the people who were trained in that context, a lot of the oncologists and the nursing staff have that sort of hardwired into their brain of don't lose weight. And we're in a very different context 30 years later. So as you said, I think the, you know, referring to a, um, a dietitian nutritionist who can actually assess the individual uh, and look at the whole package. We, you know, we don't have strong evidence that weight loss improves outcomes. We have strong evidence that being a healthy weight, but that, that doesn't help people at diagnosis if they're not at a healthy weight. So we have to, to take each individual and we can't make, uh, and, and it, it also differ, differs by cancers. There's a suggestion that weight loss may improve outcomes in breast cancer patients. But for things like head and neck and colorectal and prostate, uh, uh, sorry, pancreatic cancer, there's quite compelling evidence that it, weight loss may actually um, portend poorer outcomes. So it's very much an individual uh, calculation. All right, moving right along, here's another one. You mentioned that the data concerning lifestyle change and reduction of cancer reoccurrence is thin. Is it then scientifically legitimate to encourage lifestyle change for those who have already had a cancer diagnosis as a way to reduce risk of a reoccurrence? So recurrence is, is only one of the problems that cancer patients uh, experience. Uh, for instance, the majority of breast cancer patients will actually die of cardiovascular disease. Uh, so lifestyle modification is that we recommend, and this, this whole package of behaviors, whether we're looking at the cancer prevention setting or the survival setting, is really aimed at improving outcomes. It'll reduce your cancer risk, it'll actually reduce your risk of pretty much all of the chronic diseases, and it will improve, it will reduce, there's a, it's plausible that it will reduce your recurrence risk, it's, there's quite strong evidence that it will reduce your or improve your overall survival. So uh, I think the word used was ethical. I think it is ethical. Here's one we get often. What about supplementing with vitamin D? <laughs> Sheena, do you, I, I'm happy to answer it, but. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, again, it's one of it's. It, there's a lot of plausibility of how it could benefit, but the the evidence is not actually very strong. Um, there have been trials done in the um, in the prevention setting, uh, and in the in fact, a lot of my work in Canada was on vitamin D, and we all kind of want it to be true, uh, but we just don't have strong evidence that it makes a big difference uh, at the moment. Um, and having, you know, I was treated for cancer in the era of beta carotene being seen as the magic bullet. Uh, in fact, my mother was giving me beta carotene uh, tablet capsules. Uh, and then the, when the intervention trials were done, it showed it increased the risk of uh, lung cancer recurrence. Then a lot of my PhD was in folate metabolism, which seems all good, but now there is evidence that too much folate may actually increase the progression of uh, pre-malignant lesions and vitamin D seems all good but we just don't know, you know that we're not going to do any harm so uh, and, and and most of the population now are not actually uh, vitamin D certainly not deficient there is some level of insufficiency um, the Institute of Medicine did in, did raise the the recommendation about probably 10 years 11 years ago now um, some would argue it's not high enough, um, but we don't have the specific evidence to really support uh, a sort of deliberate supplementation with vitamin D. Thanks, Nigel. Thanks, Sheena. So I'll unfortunately, our time is up. I'm seeing more questions come in, as I know the speakers are too, and I feel like we could probably talk for another hour. But um, this is a one hour webinar, so we need to get going. However, Morgan, if you could pull the slides back up, um, I just want to, to point out to all of you that you're welcome to contact the speakers um, and their email address is up here um, on the next slide when we get there. So the conversation doesn't have to end here. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. We wanna be um, conscientious of the time and, and let you all get back to 
to clinic and everywhere else you need to be. So thanks again to SIO for allowing us to be your speakers today and um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.